dan. Ja vas sve pozdravljam i zahvaljujem što ste došli. Obrana će biti na engleskom jeziku zbog člana povjerenstva profesora Vivermana koji će nas pratiti nakon na snimci. Kako da će biti na engleskom? So again, I'd like to welcome everybody that you came here to support our colleague Clara Filek in the defense of her dissertation defense. So, uh, this defense of Clara Filek will be held in front of the Dissertation Defense Committee, which was appointed by the Council of the Department of Biology on November 9, 2022. The committee consists of following members, Associate Professor Anna Bilan from the Faculty of Food Technology and Biotechnology, Associate Professor Zrinka Ljubesic from the Faculty of Science, and myself, Associate Professor Tomis Ivankovic, also from the Faculty of Science. The third member, Professor Viverman, could not be here. He is from the Ghent University in Belgium. So first I'd like to tell that doctoral candidate, Clara Filek, has fulfilled the obligations required by the doctoral study program of biology, and therefore, in the name of the doctoral program committee and the council of the department of biology, I hereby determine that all necessary requirements have been fulfilled by which the doctoral candidate can proceed with the dissertation defense. Before we start, I would like to read a short biography of the candidate. <laughs> so, Clara Filip was born in Zadar in Croatia on November 16th in 1992, and I want to congratulate your birthday, which was last week, right? Or very recently. So there she attended elementary school and also has spent one year in the woodlands in Texas, USA, attending high school before coming back to Zadar, continuing her education. In 2011, Clara enrolled in a bachelor program in biology at the Faculty of Science, where she attained a title of bachelor in biology. And in 2016, she continued her education, but not here, but at the Uppsala University in Sweden, where she graduated as a Master of Science in Biology with specialization in Microbiology and Immunology. Clara started working as a research assistant and as PhD student in 2018 here in our faculty on the project funded by Croatian Science Foundation. The project was na is named Loggerhead Sea Turtle Careta Careta Microbiome insight into endozoic and epizoic communities, which was led by her mentor, Professor Sunčica Bosak, which is also here, and I give it her. Clara already published six high-impact scientific publications and has in total 25 conference proceedings with 10 active participations. She is also the recipient of two research and training grants, two poster awards, and two scientific photography awards, which is really very nice pictures I have seen them. Additionally, she was a teaching assistant in undergraduate and graduate courses. Clara also contributed to scientific popularization and communication events through blog writing and organizing workshops for the Biology Night, European Researchers Night and Festival of Science. So, previously, the committee concluded that the doctoral thesis entitled Diversity of Diatop and Bacterial Communities Associated with Loggerhead Sea Turtles was prepared in accordance with the previously evaluated topic and the set objective of the thesis. The doctoral dissertation is an original scientific contribution in the research field of loggerhead turtle microbiome, but also of sea turtles and microbiome host interactions in general. The scientific contribution of the doctoral thesis is visible through the publication of four original scientific papers that report the findings of the doctoral work, which were published in high impact factor journals and cited in relevant databases. So now I would like to call upon the candidate to begin with the presentation of the doctoral thesis and uh, I wish you good luck and we can get started if you will uh, take your seats. Uh, first of all, thanks to everyone for coming, and before going deeper into my results, I will first do a brief introduction of some of the, some of the important concepts and topics for you to better understand what I did for the last four years. 
So we know that 70% of the Earth's surface is covered with oceans and seas and different marine environments that also harbor plenty of different microorganisms, including prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Even though uh, we can imagine it as a soup somehow and we would expect it to be rich in microorganisms, on average, oceans and seas are relatively scarce in microbial life and in resources. We have also historically perceived microorganisms as living a planktonic life and solitary life, but now we know that they aggregate together, they form communities and often attach to different surfaces that involves living hosts. So in our oceans today, we have different hotspots of biodiversity, so to say. One of them is the coral reef of di different kinds of corals that harbor biodiversity with macro, the big animals, and microbial biodiversity. Corals are also known for living in symbiosis with microalgae that help them by producing some of the nutrients they need. And they're very, very sensitive to climate change and temperature shifts, which affects their microbes and consequently leads to coral bleaching, coral death. So this is important to investigate. Another uh, interesting organism is the Hawaiian bobtail squid that lives in association with a fluorescent bacterium that helps it um, when it needs to hide from predators or prey. And humpback whales are becoming very, very interesting for studying microbes living on their surface and inside of their body in the gut. When we talk about microbial communities associated with hosts, we usually talk into terms of microbiota and microbiome. I will be using both, so I thought it was important to define them. Uh, the microbiota uh, kind of takes these organisms in a specific host or an environment, it looks at a question of who is there. We're looking at the community and who is there, the assembly of the microbes, while the microbiome takes that and the genes that we find in those communities and kind of looks at the whole picture of microbes and their activity, the compounds that they're producing and how they can interact with the host. I will be using microbiome more when I'm referring to the bigger picture of microbial interactions with the hosts and microbiota when I'm referring to my own research because my research mostly looks at who is in a specific environment. Most of the research so far in microbiomes has been done on humans or human associated animals and from those we have learned that microbiomes can affect the host's development, immune system maturation, behavior, reproduction, it, it can even affect energy metabolism through helping with uh, nutrition and digestion. It is involved in skin barrier, uh, like it helps make it better. And now we know also that shifts in microbiome can also affect some neurodegenerative diseases. This is kind of a new field where we're connecting the brain and the gut and the microbiome of vertebrates. Even so, most of the research in this regard has been done in controlled environments or in captivity laboratory mice, and there are calls for rewilding the microbiomes of those animals because we know now that mice who have had microbiome transplants and uh, have more of a wild microbiome, their physiology shifts and they uh, show better, more natural physiological responses more closer to humans in a way. Um, wild microbiome research isn't really done as much as general human microbiome research. This is just an image that shows uh, the number of publications increasing over time and this orange bar is showing human associated microbial community studies while our purple graph is showing wild studies. Um, even then we have this category of reptiles which is relevant for my PhD thesis as it's focused on marine reptiles and here it's even a lower number in the last 40 years of research done on microbial communities there. So we don't know what is happening exactly in those, in those hosts. Uh, on studies on wild microbiomes, the, a few of them that, that have been done so far, we have learned that uh, those communities are affected by the host's phylogeny, certain traits that they have. For example, flight can affect microbiomes in a certain way, so birds and bats could have similar communities because of that. It also reflects diet and geography, and uh, we noticed that there is a formation of functional guilds, which means if we have two different hosts that live, for example, in two different habitats, but feed on the same type of food, herbivores, 
they will have different microbes, but with the same functions that can happen in the wild. Also, some of the hosts have pore microbiomes that we can find in most of the parts of the, those species, but some species, some host taxa, will have very heterogeneous microbiomes that reflect more of the environment and the climate that they're in. Also, we noticed, we know now, that there is a large reservoir of unknown microbes, unknown bacterial diversity, and we're not still sure if it's just because of undersampling some host classes that we just don't have enough information, or if it's really because there is a hidden biodiversity in that domain. So with all of this data that we have and are constantly generating now, it would be good to integrate micro microbiome data into con conservation. When we look at the vulnerability of animals in different hosts today, they're more affected by climate change, by habitat degradation, and there is an idea that their microbes will be affected as well. We just don't know at what scope is that is happening. Also, uh, microbial stewardship is an interesting concept that I've stumbled upon during this thesis where uh, just shifting microbes, adding probiotics or prebiotics to the hosts or some kind of, let's say, coral reefs, for example, we can maybe help them become more stress resilient in the future with all of the climate and environmental changes that are happening. So here we come to our protagonist, the sea turtle. Um, it fits into the category of rarely investigated hosts. It's an ancient marine reptile. It's very, very long-lived, and currently we have seven extant living species on this, on this planet. They are affected by usually human-associated habitat degradation, also climate change and different kinds of pollution. They can ingest plastic very often, which can affect their physiology as well, and sometimes even infectious diseases. The loggerhead sea turtle is the second largest of the seven. It is found worldwide, and it's an omnivore. It eats everything. We also find it feeding in the Riddick coastal uh, grounds, and in this map, you can see where we can find it in the Mediterranean. So it feeds and winters in the Adriatic Sea, where we are, by Tunisia, Greece, Turkey, and just these coastal systems. Some are found in Spain. We know we have distinct populations of loggerheads across the world, so our Mediterranean population doesn't necessarily mix with others. There's also a strong conservation efforts in this region, which uh, helped in the recent years bring this population to a point where it's fairly stable and quite healthy in this regard. Research that is done on sea turtles and loggerheads as well, usually included studying their physiology, tracking their populations, how they are uh, spread around the world. And biologging is interesting because now they're even attaching sensors to their shells to track climate conditions to predict cyclones, for example. And clinical microbiology that relates to the pathogens that can attack them, like different fungal or bacterial infections. We know that um, even Darwin, uh, marked different kind of macro epibionts that are barnacles like this. Quite a bit of growth on the shells of these turtles, but we had no idea until recently what is happening on the micro scale with the microorganisms that could be inhabiting these animals. First surveys of the internal microbiome ha happened in, with the gut and fecal matter in 2016 while first surveys on the surface of the animal that involve eukaryotic microbes started kind of in 2015 with culturing and looking what is there. Motivated by lack of data, lack of research, I also wanted to investigate the composition and diversity in the endozoic microbiome on the inside of the turtle. The second name included characterization of the epizoic microbiota, so diatoms and bacteria that are on the surface of the sea turtle, but also looking deeper into the bacteria that are associated with those diatoms, because this was a unique opportunity to see vertebrate-associated microalgae and what is happening with bacteria in this segment. And um, my third goal included isolation, identification of these diatoms, and establishing culturing protocols because we didn't really know how to approach them in the beginning and describing potential novel 
Dariton taxa. How I approach this is with uh, methodologically maybe two, two different approaches. The first one is more focused on cultivating an individual microbe that we can find on the surface of the animal and it includes primarily the whole, we start with the whole community found on the shell or on the skin and then I would isolate individual cells of diatoms and cultivate them, establish those protocols. And then from this, these cultures, I could also isolate bacteria that are intimately associated with these diatoms. It is important to notice here that when I was isolating these cells, we were careful to wash them several th times through a sterile medium to be able to remove different contaminants that we didn't want and to keep the bacteria that are intimately associated with individual cells in our culture. And then we would have diatom monoculture with its associated bacteria growing over time. Both of these were identified, well, diatoms mostly via morphology because of their specific silica frustrals and marker genes uh, for specific for diatoms and marker genes specific for bacteria. The other approach was more culture independent. In this case, we were looking at the community of microbes through sequencing the DNA. So we didn't necessarily culture anything, we just take the sample, extract the total DNA and continue with analyzing the community. And we did that for the endozoic microbiota, so the oral and cloacal samples. Here we analyzed bacteria with a specific marker gene for them. And I could do a similar kind of analysis for the epizoic microbiota, looking at both diatom communities and bacterial communities. And I could also look into my cultures to see which kind of bacteria have stayed with my diatom cells. So both of these methods, I have assigned small icons to them, so you can see here a little microscope, I hope you can see it. And for the culture independent approach, there are molecules of DNA. Throughout this presentation, you will sometimes see these icons when I, when, where I thought it was relevant to just separate these two approaches and how I did some things in here. So let's get back to the, to the aims and continue with the first aim that is focused on analyzing the composition and diversity of the inside of the turtle. So we are talking again about cloacal and oral samples. For this, uh, we analyzed 12 loggerhead sea turtles, well, took samples from them from the Adriatic Sea in the late 2018 and early 2019. They were usually found injured or caught during trawling. Sometimes turtles sleep on the bottom of the sea and a trawling net can grab them, get them to the surface and sometimes cause gas embolism, which requires them to get into rehabilitation if they can, so we can help them go, go through that. And um, we would sample them then before admission to the center and during or after rehabilitation. In, in this case, we could, we could then say that we looked at the wild microbial communities of the turtles that haven't been treated in any way prior to admission to the center. And we could say, okay, these turtles have been rehabilitating for a while, so there might be some shifts and sample them for that. So we sampled cloacal, oral, and tank water samples, extracted the DNA from them, the total DNA, did some sequencing to discover which kind of bacterial communities are in there. Um, the composition on the highest level that can discern between bacterial phyla uh, shows that we have two dominant groups, Bacteroidetes and Proteobacteria, which is somehow ex sometimes expected for these habitats. But we also see a group, Kirikimati elaiota, that appears in our cloacal samples in quite an abundance. This group of bacteria doesn't have a lot of cultured representatives, so we are not sure what, is it doing, what it's doing biologically in our turtle samples, but we do know that we can find them in the gut of horses and in marine sediments. So those are two different environments, so we need to see when they culture more of them what is happening there exactly. And you can also observe in this slide and in the next ones that the samples are separated based on the time of sampling, either before or in or during after rehabilitation, so they will be marked with an R here. So cloacal samples in rehabilitation, oral samples in, and tank water was obviously during rehabilitation. Um, in, on this level, we do not see 
major differences except for this group between our sample, sample groups and sample types. When we look deeper into the vector dates, one of the dominant groups found in, on the previous level, we can see that our oral samples in tank water have a lot of Flavobacteriaceae family and seem kind of similar, while, while the cloacal samples have a different kind of diversity there. So do, those are obvious differences on, the, on this group. When we look into the proteobacteria and the two dominant classes within those, it's interesting to see how oral samples before rehabilitation have quite a bit of Rhodobacteriaceae, which are expected for marine environments in general. But when we look at the rehabilitated samples, this, they start to resemble our tank water that doesn't necessarily have to look like the external environment that the turtle is usually in. And it's interesting to see that on the gamma proteobacteria level, we have quite a bit of unclassified sequences. This is all in light gray and gray. That confirms the, within the introduction when I noticed that there's a high unknown biodiversity of microbes. This could fit in well with that story. When we look at the community level and run some statistics, we see clear separation of oral samples against poecal samples, and even within the groups of before and rehabilitated, we see some statistical differences. When we ran the pairwise for MANOVA to see which, which samples are, which sample type groups are statistically different from one another, uh, we, from the most conservative metrics that we use, robust ages and distance, we noticed statistical significant differences in cloacal, all the cloacal samples versus the oral samples before administration, which is great. So we have a difference in the oral microbiome, but when we looked at different matrices, we could see differences between all the cloacal samples, the oral samples before, the ones that came from the sea, and our oral samples in rehabilitation. So to conclude this part, from all of these results, we know that oral bacterial communities are reflective of the environment that the turtle is in. But also we notice that there is specific microbial taxa that could be associated with the mucosa. So we have both our native microbial community and the mouth, and we have some transient species that could be coming in from the environment or from food. There's um, glycol bacterial communities. We know now that they will resist change in short-term rehabilitation. Our rehabilitation lasted for about 10 days and only one turtle was in rehabilitation for a longer period of time. We found quite a bit of unknown bacterial DNA sequences kind of indicating a hidden biodiversity of microbes in that environment. And we think that cloacal swabs could act as a sufficient proxy for fecal and distal gut samples. Usually when turtles are sampled like this, um, the cloacal swabs are quite quick. You go in and out, you get the sample, you can analyze it, but with collecting feces and deeper parts of the gut, that can be quite difficult during field work, which is why we think that if we want to sample a broader amount of turtles or just larger populations, this would be the method that could be used. It could be sufficient in detecting microbial, the shifts in microbial communities and non-invasive for the animal itself. Now we can go on to the next aim that brings us back to the surface of the turtle, to the carapace, the shell, and the skin, where I investigated diatom and bacterial communities of the total community of the surface of the animal and looked deeper into the diatom associated bacteria. And we did this on four turtles. We had four carapace and two skin samples from which I could look into the epizoic communities of diatoms and bacteria. Notice the DNA here, culture independent approach. I could also, from these samples, isolate some diatom cultures. And from the diatom cultures, isolate bacterial, uh, bacterial strains that could be there. The results from diatom communities that were done on the total community by sequences show that we have quite a bit of unclassified diatom sequences and our most abundant taxa would be Nietzsche's, Amphoras, and Colamphoras. In this light green, light purple, and darker purple colors, it takes quite a bit of abundance there. Um, since this is quite a low number of samples, we cannot tell anything about it yet. 
And when we continued on to culture these atoms, we were able to isolate 19 Xenic diatom cultures. Xenic means that they still have their bacteria with them across 11 different diatom species. Some of them were considered epizoic, um, which means from the previous literature and our own research, we observed that some of the diatoms are not found anywhere else yet, but prefer to be on our turtle host or manatee host, depending on the taxa of, of that episode diatom. But until now, we haven't found them anywhere else in the habitat of that turtle. And some of the other diatoms, we know that we can find them almost anywhere. They should be considered non-episoic. For some of them, we still don't know if they're just episoic or somewhere out there for novel species, we are not sure. Those were identified based on morphology and sequencing of the full RBCL gene. Some of them are just as examples, this is Achmantes elongata, the famous episodic diatom we've been working with. It is epizoic, moral in culture, attaches to the turtle with mucilage pads, and the cells attach to each other with the mucilage pads. The next, next example is the Polina lepidocalipola, also an episodic diatom that is motile in culture and attached to the turtle with these mucus stalks that it produces. They can be quite long. And an example of an unknown habitat preference for a diatom is this really, really small amphora. It kind of comes up to five micrometers in length. But for this one, we really are not sure which kind of habitat it prefers. So now we have our diatom cultures, and we sequenced them. We got their marker gene, and we could look into how our cultures are reflected in the community data that I showed you previously. So the sequences of the Atlantis elongata were compared to our diatom community that was identified through different databases, not by us directly. It is um, wrongly assigned to either amphoras, nichias, or to just a phylum of diatoms. So there's no proper identification of these sequences when looking at the community level. This means that within this data that we got just from sequencing the diatoms, not looking into the morphology, all of these nichias, amphoras, and calamphoras could maybe contain the episodic diatoms that we do not yet have the DNA reference for. This shows that culturing and isolating these cells is very important so we can enrich those databases and get higher resolution in our results and do correct identifications of those sequences that we get from community level surveys. Before I go into the bacterial segment of these results, I just wanted to show briefly how the episodic lifestyle looks like. This is the previously mentioned Polina lepidocalicola diatom that has a bit of mucus around it and produces that very, very long stalk that it uses for attachment. It is laying on this brown colored, this is just an artificial coloring here, but this should be uh, exopolysaccharides produced either by other microbes or some other type of life living on the turtle. And in purple, you can see bacterial cells surrounding these. The sphere around the diatom, diatom exudes nutrients sometimes, this is called a phycosphere. Bacteria can inhabit this sphere, and I will be using that term in the rest of the presentation. So technically what we are looking at next is the whole total bacterial community and the phycosphere bacterial community, the bacteria that were closely attached or intimate just with the diatom before or after we isolated it. So um, we did again hair face and skin samples and we analyzed diatom cultures or what we could consider the phycospheres on this side, you can see uh, six samples that are from the turtle, from the source environment from where these cultures were isolated from. On the left side are all diatom monocultures with their own bacteria, and these are several different levels of uh, taxonomy for the bacteria. The first thing that we noticed was that we have a much lower diversity of bacterial communities in our diatom cultures in comparison to their source environment, which kind of makes sense when you look at the way that we isolated them. We see 52 amplicon sequence variants on average in diatom cultures in comparison to 900 and something in our initial source environments, the total community of the turtle. 
Next, we notice enrichments in different bacterial taxa. So we have enrichments of Alcantiporax, Marinobacter, and even bacteria in the plankton with mycetotophyllum. You can see that in this segment and here. And it is interesting that within this phylum, we have known uh, bacteria that inhabit algae and surfaces of the algae and could be related to their EPS production, the extra, extracellular polysaccharides that they produce. And we find these in our considered to be episode diatoms that really do produce these compounds at a higher level, in, at least from what we've seen. At the community level, we could, so these are the two, uh, these are all the same samples. This is the same figure, basically. It's just colored differently, depending on what I wanted to show. Here, it is colored by a diatom genus. So the green samples are Achnantes genus. While these are colored based on the source sample ID, either the carapace or the skin of the turtle where the diatom came from. And what we see are groupings mostly based on the source that the diatom came from. This, this means that the bacterial communities reflect the environment that they were isolated from, which makes sense. And we find uh, that this is significant with the robust agent cell metric. We do not see any um, statistical significance for the diatom genus and separating of the samples at that level. But when we look at Another metric that is a bit more lenient, we could say that our microbial communities group based on the diatom genus and on the source environment that they came from. From our diatom cultures, we also managed to isolate bacteria. We actually didn't isolate bacteria from all of the diatom cultures used in here, but only 10 to get an overview of what is possible. We had in total 127 isolates, and 40 of them are, were further characterized by full 16S sequencing. We were successful in isolating members of the Rhodobacteriaceae phylum, as expected, and we had quite a bit of Alcanivorax, the one that was enriched in the previous slide. Uh, we could isolate them as well. They are interesting because they are oil, oil degraders, and research today is involved in using them to help with any kind of oil contaminations and they could be here because they really like the oils the diatoms might be producing. This is interesting for biotechnological purposes. We also identified a minimum of two strains that could be novel genera within the Flavobacteriaceae family. <clears throat> to conclude the second name, we know that our diatom and bacterial communities on the surface of the turtle are quite diverse. The taxonomy assignment for uh, our diatom sequences when looking at the community level is difficult because we don't have reference sequences in databases yet. And here we need to cultivate the epizoic diatoms to get their sequences and to be able to identify them properly at the community level data. And our phycospheres uh, the bacterial communities of those can reflect both their source environment and the diatom genus that they're associated with. And it's interesting the diatoms enrich microbial taxa that are quite rare in our source samples like Alcanivorax, for example, um, that sometimes are even not detected on the community level, but they are happily growing with the diatoms. This could aid novel taxa discovery, cultivation, and even some biotechnology for biotechnology purposes. Moving on to the third and final aim of this thesis, which involves identification, isolation, cultivation, just handling diatoms. Um, in here, we are focusing again first on the community on the surfaces of the turtles. And we are isolating these cells, trying to grow them in sufficient amounts, identify them by morphology and different types of sequencing to get to know who they are. For this aim, in total, six, more than 600 strains of, of epizoic diatoms were successfully isolated. But relating to loggerhead sea turtles and my own PhD work, we were about a little bit more than 200 strains that were cultivated with varying success in long-term culturing, sometimes they would live for a short while in the culture and die. Uh, different uh, success in molecular characterization and prior preservation. On, in general, they do prefer classic uh, diatom culturing conditions as such as the F2 medium with added silica, 
the cultures between 18 and 24 degrees, the light for 12 hours and dark for 12 hours, but we noticed that they prefer lower light conditions than the average planktonic diatom. They get very, very stressed if they're exposed to strong light for a long time. Some of these potential exclusively episodic diet of taxa are the already mentioned Achnantes, so Lata, our Polina Lepidocalicola, but also Proschemia, Sulcata, and Praspodostaurus Lego Bellanus. From all of these strains that we isolated, when we looked at their sequences and compared them to some other diatoms we know, here you can see the Proschemia and the Polina that are in the phylogenetic tree. From this, we know that they're polyphyletic and that the preference for the epizoic habitat evolved multiple times in the diatom evolution history. We also, for some of these taxa, notice that they carry some genetic differences based on the host population they were isolated from. So our Adriatic Sea polinas from a specific turtle that we had will be slightly different from turtles that uh, were sampled in Florida or South Africa. We see similar patterns with our Achnantes elongata, but also this is still a work in progress because we have just managed to obtain multiple different sequences for our own isolates that when added to this data set might tell some kind of different story. For the novel uh, diatom, diatom taxa, Within my PhD, we newly described Praspodostaurus legobelanus that was found on turtles in South Africa and Croatia. And we also have several new potential diatom taxa species. We will see what happens with them. Fallacia, Psamodiction, and Amphora, which were collected from juvenile or subadult turtles in the Adriatic. So to conclude this segment, I want to say how episode diatoms can indeed be cultivated successfully without their host. The preference for their episodic habitat evolved multiple times in the diatom history. We can notice some genetic differentiation between different populations of hosts. We look at some diatom taxa, and we know that there are many novel diatom taxa to be discovered. Also, in regards to these results, and some of the results in the previous aim, we are quite aware that culturing is really crucial for obtaining both the representative sequences for any kind of DNA-based surveys in the future, but also to understanding diatom bi biology, the epizoic diatom lifestyle. To summarize, we go back a bit to the inside communities of our turtles. The oral bacteria communities were described the fir for the first time within my PhD project at least for loggerheads. Um, we know that they reflect the turtles' environment, they harbor maybe specific bacterial taxa for the mucosa. Our cloacal communities are stable during short-term rehabilitation, and we think that just by swabbing these, we can successfully detect microbial community shifts in these hosts. There's no ne need necessarily for more invasive sampling. Then, when we look at our epizoic microbial communities, they're quite potent sources of novel microbial taxa, both diatom and bacterial, and are quite diverse in these. Looking deeper into the epizoic diatom strains, we know that we can successfully cultivate them without the host. Reference sequences definitely enhance DNA-based surveys, and they recapitulate hosts of origin, their source of origin, both in phylogeny and phycosphere bacterium in the bacterial communities of the diatom. They also enrich specific bacterial taxa, which is quite interesting and exciting for detecting some of the bacteria that are usually quite rare and difficult to cultivate. These are the publications that are the basis of this uh, PhD dissertation. And with this, I would close the scientific part of the presentation and go to the acknowledgments, where I just want to thank my supervisor, Sunchitsa, the committee that was involved in this thesis from the beginning, and everyone that worked on this with us. We couldn't have done this with our collaborators, just sampling people teaching me how to do stuff, and just hanging in there for the last four years. There were many across different continents. We had collaborators from Africa, United States, and different parts of Europe. And I would also like to thank my family and friends for hanging in there um, and probably 
not really understanding what I was blabbering about for the last four years, but I hope this kind of made it a bit more clear. Thank you. this slide to kind of invite the audience to think about potential questions while I answer the questions from the committee. Great. Thank you, Clara. This was a beautiful um, presentation. I wish it would last it more. I was so into uh, everything. <laughs> really great. So uh, now the committee will uh, give you questions. I think we'll have them in writing, right? Yes. And uh, I suggest you take maybe a few minutes to read on them, uh, to read all the questions, and then answer them uh, as you wish, uh, whichever order you wish for. Is that okay? Yes. Should I? I should also read them out loud for the audience as well. So yeah, yeah sure. Any creations and just translate them. Yeah. Ah, okay. I will read that. Okay. So we have them. Questions? Maybe if the audience needs a minute or two to go out and uh, I don't know, have a water or something, now is the time for a minute or two or three and we give a lot of some time to recuperate. Okay, I think I'm ready if everyone else is as well. Yes, are we ready? I yes. will. Okay. I will start. Uh, with the question, uh, I will just read it as it is. Uh, tell me more about Kiritimatia laota. Is it a marine bacteria or a gut bacteria? Your findings, in your findings, is it accidental in the experiments or abundant in turtles, reptiles in general? So I, I did mention uh, that uh, we, we do not know yet a lot about their biology, but when I looked into the results of um, other research groups that handle the gut microbiome of the sea turtles, there were some indications in some sampling types, not necessarily feces, but more deeper in the gut, that they are also there. The issue with this group is that the nomenclature has been changing in the recent years, so some of the other groups might be this group in the previous results, which I have not had the time to compare those because I realized that quite after the, the publication. I cannot say, I, I wouldn't say that it's accidental in my results. I would say that there is something there, but it could be enrichment based on the methods of amplification of DNA. The, the abundance itself doesn't have to be biological, but just an artifact of how we did things. So that would, we would need more samples to investigate that and proper protocols and also investigate it on the meta scale level with all the other turtles that we have the data for. Um, we, I, I don't know if they're abundant in reptiles and turtles in general. I have not seen the data that would look into that yet. We might see it in the future with novel databases and sequencing. I hope I answered that. Actually, you did pretty, uh, not pretty much, but very nice. <laughs> Perfect, I would say. <laughs> because I uh, haven't, I don't know anything about this. Uh, it's quite, bacteria. it's fairly new. So that's why it was really interesting to me, and uh, you really, yes, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question is, compare the microbiota of the skin of humans, the important for, importance for immunity and health, and the skin, the surface uh, shell of the turtle. Is, is the, does the microbiome have any kind of function on the turtles, or are they just hitchhikers? How can we show this and prove this? This is a very interesting question that I have been thinking for for a while. I can't say that I know what kind of effect the external microbiome of the turtle has on its health directly, but what I know is that the shell itself is quite innervated and it has a lot of blood flow and it takes, it receives input and signals from the surface. There could be something there. Also, from the aspect of turtle being surrounded by its microbial cloud, I would think that maybe some kind of composition of microbes on the shell could be for beneficial for health sometimes. And if the turtle is sick and the composition shifts, it could maybe be detrimental in hosting more pathogens than usually. But at this point, I'm not sure. 
And the only way of testing it, I think, would involve controlled experiments with germ-free turtles that I don't think will happen because they're quite a protected species. But I don't, I don't see another way to compare bleach. these. <laughs> yeah, bleach them, technically. But maybe, uh, okay, I'm not so into turtles, but are there some kind of uh, model organism turtles that are not uh, endangered? Sea turtles, no. Maybe terrestrial freshwater turtles. But, but I'm, I'm you buy, you buy for uh, pets? Maybe. I'm, I'm not aware of model, model okay. turtles for, for science, but pets could maybe be done. I know that they do uh, this stuff on chicken. They're kind of reptilian in origin, where they take eggs and put them in different conditions and see how the microbiota develops. But for turtles, I'm not so sure. Uh, very interesting. I, I also didn't know that the, the carpus, right, the, the shell is, uh, as you say, alive. It's quite innervated. Quite innervated yeah. and, uh, they can feel the, the brushes when we would sample them. Mm -hmm. Also, they tend to like brushing against stones and even some kind of brooms in conservation centers. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, the third question is this microbial stewardship, is it plausible or even needed for turtles? How do your results fall into this? Well, I think that uh, within the population that we sampled, uh, I didn't go into that in the presentation, but we had sampled turtles in the rescue center that had them in tanks with artificial salt water, which was in marine seawater, and we had turtles from tanks that were held um, with seawater that was previously filtered or, or treated in some ways. But there are differences in those two water sources because one actually comes from the sea, has all the nutrients, it's the microbes might need on the turtles, and the other one is just water with salt. Um, so in that way, and from our results, we think that it would be more beneficial for a turtle to be in a more natural state environment to help that kind of microbiota stay there and possibly help with other physiological stuff. There's no clear indication if we would need to steer the microbiome of the turtle as they're, uh, they are very resilient as reptiles in recovering from any kind of disease that succumbs them. So I, I don't know how to answer this question, really. Do we need the microbial sewers for them? I don't know yet, but I think we need to look into that with the changing environments and everything, if that could help. So do you think in general it could be like when the humans take probiotics, uh, like the pills or something, that we could also do this for the animals, sea animals like give them some kind of microbial bath or something to... I think, yes, it could be done, but at this point, we don't know what to give them. Okay. This research is mostly done on corals for now, because they're quite urgent in, in coral bleaching, but for, uh, for turtles, I'm, I'm, I still think that we're at the point where we don't know what exactly is in there and what the functions are. The reptiles, so their immune systems, are slightly different from vertebrates and mammals, and that they are vertebrates, but from mammals. Um, so I think we would need to have structured studies, maybe on related reptiles, to see which kind of communities would actually be beneficial for them. At this point, I think we don't know that yet. Okay. And for the corals, they get like uh, results. Uh, uh, from mean, what I've seen, only at the just... from what I've seen only at the conferences, they are on their way to actually make products that could help uh, okay. with nice. colonizing corals with something nicer. Before you go, I'd like to comment on your English, which is quite excellent. Oh, thank you. Is it because you were in the USA or? I think that's a part of it. Listening to uh, someone from the United States, it's really nice. I think it's a, it's a part of it. I was 14 at the time, so I, I have a bit of that Texas draw sometimes. Great, yes. Very nice to listen. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we'll uh, continue to another set of questions from... Professor Bielen. To isolate diatom associated bacteria, you used marine agar, a rich medium that supports the growth of marine heterotrophs and incubated in place at 15 or 20 degrees for several days. Since it is known that most environmental bacteria are difficult or impossible to culture, what changes would you make to the protocol to increase the number of species isolated? And based on the comparison of uncultured ASVs and isolated bacteria, which taxa would you prioritize for cultivation? This is also a very good question. 
Um, I wish we had more time to work on that department of diet of associated bacteria. We did choose marine agar specifically because it's quite easy to use and use everywhere. But I feel that if we used more different types of media at this, these conditions, we would also increase the number of bacteria that are cultivated. Also, I think dilution would help quite a bit. Um, and since there are, they are surface bacteria, I didn't notice, I didn't mention it here, but in, in the paper, in the thesis itself, we used both the wash of the diatoms and the diatoms crushed, the pellets crushed. So some kind of diatom exudates would possibly help some bacteria and some could possibly grow without them. I think that could also affect it. So, and I, I thought about what uh, what taxa have you seen in ASPs uh, that you could couldn't culture one or another, and uh, you think maybe that. And now, when, when I was listening to you, I started thinking about uh, these bacteria you have associated with diatoms. Uh, are they are they really like important for diatoms themselves, or you just cannot rid of them? And they do not do much harm. We do not. You know what I yeah, mean. I know. Because Are they just opportunistic with them, and we cannot remove them because they're sticky, or exactly. if they're actually important? Yes, yes, I understand. I think that. Are they good for diatoms, or does not harmful? We we cannot say the say those things from my data, for example. But we do know that there are specific taxa, for example, in the Rhodobacteriaceae family that are actually quite beneficial for the diatom, or are producing some kind of antimicrobial compounds that would affect other predatory bacteria coming in. From my data, um, I cannot say for sure who is doing what uh, because we haven't done the experiments like that. I just looked into the community. But to be able to test that, I would first have to make an exenic culture that is without bacteria. Is it possible? It is, in some how diatoms. Is it, how it is done? It's done mostly with uh, treatments with different kinds of antibiotics in series, and if you have to test it then, do you have any kind of microbial DNA left? Um, and some of the diatoms can take it. We add vitamins to the medium, because bacteria are usually important in vitamin production for them. So with vitamins, some of them can grow without their bacterial consortium, but not all. We have tried some of that for Polina. Polina handled antibiotic treatment quite well, but we never really got to a point where it, where it was completely exenic. We didn't have necessarily time for that. But this could be done to kind of illustrate, is this strain actually benefiting the diatom? Is it important or not? Th this would be done next in this regard. Yes, and then you could compare. Yeah. And for the specific taxa that I would prioritize for cultivation, there have been some taxa that we managed to cultivate but have not been detected in the ASVs at all. Okay. I think those would be quite interesting to focus on a bit because they, they really were not detected in the DNA anywhere and they probably were not contamination because that group usually associate, is associated with marine environments. But I think it's, I would focus on the, probably on the plankto mycetota phylum that we found in Rich. And I'm really stuck on this Alcanevorax genus that I really, really like. So I think those would be my first starting taxa for future research. Okay. Thank you. I hope I answered uh, what you were interested in. Okay, the next question. What are the techniques for long-term preservation of diet and bacteria xenic cultures? And according to the literature and your experience, how stable are these cultures over time and depending on the cultivation conditions? This is a good question, and I do not know the answer. Um, the, the techniques for long-term cryopreservation is just getting diatoms through a series of dilutions of DMSO sometimes and trying not to stress them too much and freeze them in liquid nitrogen. <coughs> and our diatoms here seem yeah, to... So like 10%, 5%? I'm actually... I think the, the technician that showed me the technique used gradients up to 5-ish or something. It also depends on the size of the diatom cell. If the diatom cell is large, then it would need a higher concentration to perfuse the cell right away. So you keep them in growing, in growing concentration uh, before I you think so. Them. I think so, yes. Uh -huh. yes. And then I do not know how that affects the community of bacteria, though, with them. That has not been tested. To my knowledge, I have not seen it tested anywhere yet regarding the bacteria. I would expect it to change before freezing enough. 
I would a complex mixture. I would also think so. Maybe the ones that are deeper in the mucus of the diatom could be slightly more protected, but I'm I'm not sure how sturdy they are on the community level. And during time, if you're transient, yes, then maybe yes. They might well. Change. I do have some indication on that. That work isn't published yet. I've talked to a colleague at the conference that did similar work with diatoms and communities in the cultures. And what they noticed is that the community shifts right after isolation within the first few weeks, and then it's stable over time. Which was quite interesting for me, but I, I could just cite the correspondence and not the paper yet, because our cultures uh, have been in culture for quite a long time, and we I also did duplicates with with um, sequencing. So I think our communities really do stabilize after a year or so. Well, even after a couple of months, okay. in that regard. Yeah. And the third question is: It is well known that the host-associated microbiome is highly dependent on and reflects a variety of factors such as host fitness, life stage, nutrition and biotic and abiotic environmental factors. In mammalian systems, the effects of these factors are slowly being unraveled over the last few decades. How far are we from defining the healthy microbiome of sea turtles as opposed to dysbiotic microbiome? What further studies are needed to achieve these goals? This is a good question, and I don't think um, we are that close to defining the healthy microbiome in, in the gut at least. We do have more and more samples, but I feel like we can't really point to a specific group of microbes that we see in certain conditions. The sampling is quite spread out across populations. So I, I, I don't trust the data as much to say like, okay, this group is in sick turtles and this group is in healthy turtles. I think we need much, much more information for that. But this is being done uh, by other groups that are trying to sample more wild turtles. And from healthy wild uh, individuals, I think we can get that information for sure. This was just a smaller sampling um, sample, sample yes, group. Yes, yeah. Just caught injured or accidentally. And yes, I think further studies would, be, would need to be in wild, like specifically, strictly defined healthy individuals, not and maybe some immune parameters also. Biomarkers, for example, yes. yeah, maybe sampling to different biological samples with them to test that. I think some of the work on that is being done, but not related to the microbiome yet. I think there are some people that are interested in that as well for future studies. Okay. And the last set of questions. Uh, having in mind these results and the lifestyle of the turtles, how would, uh, how would you comment a famous saying, everything is everywhere, but the environment selects? Do your results confirm that or not? And if yes, and which scope or amount? Um, I, I find this an interesting question because, first of all, I, I don't know if I'm convinced that everything is everywhere. I know that microbes can disperse, disperse quite easily with wind and water and sand from deserts, but I don't know if we have proof that everything really is everywhere. I don't think we know that yet. And we would need to test that first to say everything is everywhere and the environment selects. We definitely do know that the environment has a crucial component in selecting the functions of the microbes, but not necessarily the microbial co uh, composition because we know that different types of microbes can have the same functions. I think that's more what's happening here. Um, and in my results, well, this is mostly for, for diatoms, uh, an, an interesting question since these episodic ones, we only see them on turtles. We do not yet see them anywhere else, but now we have the sequences to check if we can see them somewhere else. Maybe their amount is so little that we will have trouble detecting them, but maybe we will see a sequence or two in another habitat that could be a potential source. So I'm, that's kind of how I feel about the, this whole subject. I don't know if I answered the question. Well, so does your data confirm that or not? If I'll you would kind of have to answer the case or not. So first you said you don't, because it's kind of, it's philosophy. Philosophy. It's a philosophical, okay. Yes, it's not a I would, I, I can't say with certainty. So you were kind of suspicious towards that? Yeah. Your results, you were suspicious more or less 
Or I'm more things? suspicious. More suspicious. Okay. I, I don't think everything is everywhere. <laughs> I think there are enclaves of microorganisms, but people would disagree with me, of course, I think. Yeah, but nobody knows really, I mean. Yeah. Okay. Can I go to the next one? Yeah. Um, uh, how do you, what do you think about the possibility of transferring eventual pathogens from the adult individual turtle to the egg's nest or even to the hatchlings? How does the process of microbiome development on young hatchlings look like? And how do number and the type of particles, organic and inorganic, in the water column can affect that development? Okay, so first for the pathogens from the adult adult uh, individual to the eggs and nest, I think that there could definitely be some transfer as reptiles, the turtles, they do not really care for their young, but the female needs to dig the nest and cover it and lay the eggs. So I think there definitely could be some pathogen transfer in that sense. Um, how? That is the question, actually. So just either through the cloaca, the okay. egg passage, okay. through the cloaca, it can pick up some of the gut microbes, where there could be but potential. Is that the question? So yeah, depends. I think it depends on the contents that are there. Some so of the literature, there, there is some idea. A little bit. There's been a recent study, I think, published this year even, that has looked into the microbiome of the eggs and dead hatchlings or unhatched eggs. And they, they see some of the similar taxa that we find on surfaces and in the cloaca. And there could definitely be a transfer from the cloaca, but the factors that affect if the egg will get damaged from those, those microbes, I think it's also quite environmentally connected to the moisture in the, in the nest or the amount of abrasiveness of the sand that could also affect the barrier uh, leading the microbe into the egg itself. And if we look at a healthy hatchling, when it goes out of the egg, it will also pick up some of the microbes in the near vicinity and probably by ingesting a bit of sand and getting in contact to it, that could be the, f the first initial introduction to microbes that it has, the mm -hmm. microbiota. Yeah, having that to the beginning of the whole process. Yes. So you're having a kind of, well, it's never clean, so to say, I mean, of course. But it's so different, the environment changes so much from the turtle to the egg, so to say. So it's kind of, uh, especially when we're thinking, where could all those organisms come from? Yeah. So this is what, if they're living uh, on the skin or on the carapax or whatever, so it's also a different environment. So yes, I yes. they're very specific, as we heard, they're all extremely specific. Yes, yes. They're not opportunistic species, they are just something that really is there. So how how do these get there? Yes. So these or a darter, for example. Yes, so the they darter. Don't survive on the eggs. I, I can't imagine for hatchlings, and I don't think we have enough data for them. We our data is mostly based on juveniles and adult turtles. Yeah, it's also not There's, something that you did just. It's also yeah. I mean, when I was thinking about it, I would say that it's the environment and maybe interacting with other tur turtles when they're larger. That could also. If they get in, like, they're quite solitary, but they could interact at some point. Um, and of course, uh, different habitats that they go to, they're quite like surface dwelling, feeding. Um, all of these environments could be a potential source for colonization, all of them. I'm just not sure at which scope the colonization happens near the coast or in the op open seas or interacting with their hosts, their food, even algae and the fish, crabs, that would also be a source. Mm -hmm. So that is also connected to the other part, regarding the particles. Yes. So just kind of the similar thing. So yeah, I can, I can go to it yeah. right now um, and just read it shortly. Um, yeah, I, I read it already. Yeah, the, the particles, I was, uh, t when, I, when I think about it. Is it irrelevant first? Do you think it is irrelevant? I think it is. I think the amount of particles that the surface that the turtle comes in contact with would definitely be relevant in colonization because, as I said in the introduction, microbes um, inhabit different types of surfaces. They will attach to these either organic or inorganic particles. Or plastic, for example. Ex exactly, plastic. There are studies on stuff attaching to plastic as well, and turtle eating that as well. So I would expect that that would quite have quite an impact on the colonization as well. If the turtle is coming in contact with it or even ingesting it, 
all of that could affect the, the microbiome development process, I think. For the, okay, this was the particles, we solved that. And the next question is, uh, we are witnessing the rise in global temperatures, and how do you think this trend would reflect on the epizoic and the endozoic microbiome of the sea turtle? Would you expect differences in the microbiome depending on the body site where it is developing? Um, I, I, think, I think the increase in temperatures would reflect on the external microbiome, definitely. For the internal one, I think it could be probably more related to food sources, which could also be affected by climate change as well. And I don't think that it is just based on the environmental like, temperature or chemical effects, but also by changes in the behavior of the turtle. In the recent years, we had turtles that were never nesting in the North Adriatic. We registered the first nest around Venice. So if the turtle is reaching over to new habitats, it could be exposed to some kind of novel microbes it hasn't seen before. Realistically, maybe some novel foods it has seen. It's, it's kind of um, something that could happen to them as well as they move away from all that heat. So I, I expect that that would definitely have an impact. And it's also related to this part um, of the different body sites and the development of the microbiome. So for the external part of the turtle, the, the shell, um, there has been some research that has shown on the macroscopic level that the anterior part and the posterior part have different growths of algae because the water affects the front part of the shell differently than the last one. We have drag, different kind of physical forces that can affect the attachment of these organisms. So I would definitely expect there that different conditions would, af would affect the micro niches and micro development there. Unfortunately, in, this, uh, in this, these projects, we looked at the total community. That was more interesting to us as we studied these initially. But it would be interesting to see um, how these microorganisms congregate in different parts. But I'm also thinking about the microanatomy there, because most of these episodic diatoms, they like to kind of hide in the crooks of pieces of the carapace, maybe hide from environmental conditions. So that's also another micro niche that, that could have an effect there, the, like depends what we see mm -hmm. in that part. Not necessarily like in polls, it's really negative. Here it doesn't have to be negative. Yeah. It will be kind of strange. It, we don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But I would expect that they will adapt because the historically sea turtles as marine reptiles, they have adapted to many different conditions looking through the last 120 million years. <laughs> I think I covered all of them. Yes, thanks. Yes, thank you for the questions. What are thank next? you for the comprehensive answers. Uh, first, I would like to, before we take questions from the audience, uh, I would like to ask Professor Sulcica, class mentor, to give us a few words, if you will. Yeah, of course. Um, <coughs> congratulations, Clark. <laughs> it was a wonderful presentation on uh, our work that we did. Uh, but can you just a little bit emphasize, so um, our hypothesis, how come we could uh, cultivate these epizoic diatoms if they are epizoic? So the hypothesis, how come they can grow in a petri dish? Yeah, so, so we, we initially, since we think they're just epizoic, we don't find them anywhere else. It is kind of weird that we can cultivate them without the host. And one of the ideas is that they might use the help of the bacteria that are there. Um, I'm not fully convinced in that. I think there could be some other factors that are actually benefiting those diatoms on, on the turtle. But this would also have to be tested through the exenic methods. If we see that those diatoms can grow without bacteria whatsoever, then the bacteria association is not there, definitely. But then how to test the host factors that can affect those diatoms, different kind of nooks and crannies that they could find or nutrients, I really can't, can't say what would affect them more. But it's, it's a question that we didn't really answer within my PhD project, even though we wanted to. It's quite difficult to test what is there, actually. Do they attach? Do they attach to ones with those stalks? Yes. Do they attach to the petri dish? Yes. Uh, they, they attach wherever. Right. And an interesting thing that I, I noticed... In the same way. In the same way. Like I think so. Yeah. I think so. 
from the from the, the same same electron microscopy. Is the same yeah. With the, yeah, in the cultures itself and in the original samples. What I did notice with a project that's mm -hmm. on kind of related to this, but it didn't end up in my thesis, is that in comparison to some of the opportunistic strains that we used, for example, the diplones or psamodiction that are non-epizoic, when you grow them in culture and don't shake them, they will kind of settle on the bottom, they won't do much. But if they're grown together with the episodic diatoms, the acnantes there, it will branch out and lift from the surface, from the bottom of the culturing well, and end up at the interface of water and air. And we will have just the non-epizoic at the bottom and have just the acnantes at that interface over like, two months in culture. They do that. Is that a biological effect? I don't know, but they can float. They spread out their surface and they end up quite a bit higher. So, so it's a behavior in co-cultures. Yes, think. yes. That's when we culture them together. How relevant that is biologically, I have no idea. I do not know how I could test that on turtles, but it's a behavior that happens in our is culture. It no, it might be within a year. Yeah, but it sounds so interesting. Yeah, and it's, it's on, on the way to being uh, analyzed. And it's an interesting observation. Yeah. PhD would last for six years, it would be another PhD. <laughs> yeah, I can do the second one. <laughs> yes, that's it. Okay, thank you. And now I would like, really like to uh, hear some comments from the audience. So please, if you will, for questions. Yes, please. Uh, so first of all, thank you also. Um, I have no knowledge about, about microbiology, and this was still very clear for me. Uh, there's still like a bit of a general question I have, like why are we trying to figure out what's on and in? <laughs> <laughs> because and we can. <laughs> and because we got funded. Yes. <laughs> yes. And then maybe a second question, in the future once we know more about these, is there some practical uses of that knowledge? I think there could be there could be practical uses because this is these are habitats that haven't been studied until seven or like eight years ago, and there's an enormous amount of microbial biodiversity there. There's an enormous amount potentially from a biochemical, biotechnological perspective of different things that they could do that we have not seen yet in our microbes. And all of these things could lead to technological advances, different, better enzymes, enzymes that would be maybe or different kind of protein products that could be more suitable to reptiles because these are microbes from reptiles for treating other reptiles. Like, there's plenty of ideas that, that come up uh, to me on why am I doing this. But my, my, most of my motivation comes from, okay, this is an unknown habitat. There's a lot of unknown biodiversity. What is in there? What are they doing? So some of the questions I could answer, but most of them, no. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Please, somebody else. Yeah, from the colleagues. Yes. Uh, just a comment. Uh, beautiful presentation and beautiful work, of course, Clara. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, uh, the comment on the when you said that uh, you have some uh, cultivated bacteria but not found in ASVs at all. Yes. Uh, maybe you could check uh, also the data sets prior to filtering of chimeras or something, or little, less quality DNA sequences because those. Um, maybe rare taxa yeah. could be, because of PCR bias, could be... Uh, maybe one, one read. Yeah. yeah. Maybe they are really rare, and maybe they are there, but they didn't just get so much energy yes. that you... Yes, I agree. I agree. Places. You're right. So maybe they are there. It could, they could be there. Also, we have a, a complementary data set from my colleague here, Lucia, that also looked into that. But yeah, I could look into that data as well to yeah, see they're if they're on other turtles. They're, they're cultured, they're there. They were just not picked up yeah. by, by our yeah. technology. Yeah, and for this uh, very interesting uh, comments about uh, growing episodic diatoms uh, in the petri dish, uh, you had at the beginning of the cultivation, you had all these mixed cultures and everything with the chops of the exocarp, you know? Yeah, I think we started with yeah, pieces, yeah. pieces of the carapace, so, yeah. For the future references, it will be very nice to see maybe in the zinic monocultures to use some maybe washed 
Caracas pieces and then to see how they will attach to those Caracas and how yes. they will attach to the Petri dish and maybe that's a great idea. Yeah. For example, have maybe Which like a glass slide that, yes. and a piece of sterilized, yes, yes. cleaned. And to do transcriptomics, of course. Uh, yeah. 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 That, that would be the first. Yeah, that would be a perfect yeah. picture. Less time. It's doable. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. it is. Definitely. Yeah, the first thought was that some kind of an animal extract yeah. actually uh, needed for those dyes to be able to attach to those kind of pieces. Yeah. 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 With pieces of uh, of the chiropractic yeah. or the skin, yeah. but it's definitely after some time you see it doesn't. It's not necessarily yeah. 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 At least for the diatoms that we looked at, maybe there yeah. are some that we missed that actually need a carapace. Yeah. yeah. Or skin pieces. Yeah, but most of it is just pure luck. Yeah, that that's what we found out. You know as well. <laughs> Like, you know, it's possible that they just like a petri dish. I mean, yeah. my problem is can be really. Uh, yeah, but, that, that's, own, so. but that's my point, for instance, for Polina, we were like, I think five, no, six of us chasing that, yeah. isolating yeah. it, like uh, very intensively, and lonely Lucia. I think I got one. Golden, you know, uh, arm. <laughs> yeah, I got Palazia, though. Yes. <laughs> That's a tiny one. Have feelings as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's your choice. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's the effort. Yes. Everything can be cultivated if you put enough effort. And that's, um, yeah, that's costly. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your cooperation. And now I will ask the committee. We will have to uh, withdraw for deliberation for a few minutes. And by you can address the